culinary related entertainment. <laughs> Aloha Maui Nui. Hey, this is Josh Porter here. And Jason Burkhardt. How you doing? This is the Solar Coaster. Solar Coaster episode number 42. Don't panic. 42. What happened? How did we get to that place? <laughs> We're going to be covering photovoltaic past, present, and future. We got a great call in today from Andre Richter at Meyer Burger, who I think we're kind of theorizing is the future of photovoltaic panels and manufacturing, Jay. Yeah, they've got a lot of interesting equipment on offer, but I'm, I'm interested to hear the historical perspective very much. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. So we're going to take a little stab at it. We're going to kind of go through some of you know typical news and events. We'll do a little bit of that, and we're going to jump into some uh, kind of pre-photovoltaic history, a little bit of phot photovoltaic history, and then Andre is going to come in and really give us the, the actual scoop, uh, which we're really excited yeah, about. Yeah, we're, ho we're hopeful that by going through the history, we'll maybe we'll get a little uh, future vision as well. We'll Absolutely. see where we're, where, from, where we're going from where we've been, right? See if we're, yeah. <laughs> we got a beat on it. All right, let's go through some housekeeping, folks. So this is The Solar Coaster. We are uh, right here at KOI 1110 AM. We can be found Fridays at 105 PM, uh, and we also are on a couple of FM stations, 96.7 FM Central Maui, 96.5 FM Westside, 98.7 FM Upcountry. Call-ins are welcome. Uh, on this show, we're probably going to be a little too dense to catch them <laughs> because uh, we're trying to fit in quite a bit. But just so you know, 242-7800 is our call-in line, uh, and uh, so you can check that out. And then we have a great website. Jay, you want to tell us about the website? Sure, www.solar-coaster.com. You can go there, listen to our live stream right now. You can actually kick into the YouTube and watch us jump into this, jump into the studio with us right here. Uh, you can also go back on the podcast link and go back and catch all our old shows, which now there are quite a few of them. So do check that out. There are a couple, and I, I, you were just telling me today I was remiss in uploading those SoundCloud files. So apparently I'm a few <laughs> few uh, episodes back, so I got to get on that right away. Slow. <laughs> yeah, we're a few episodes so. light, but we'll get that in short order. But, uh, there's also a mailing list link. Go down to the bottom of the page. You can actually sign in. If you can't call in during the show, uh, fill out the form on the bottom. It comes right to our email. We can get your questions on the air even without you having to call in. Yeah, you know what's kind of blowing my mind too is that we're actually getting you know mailing lists as subscribers in YouTube and people in SoundCloud kind of liking it and sharing it. All of a sudden, like the other day, like Saturday, there were like five or six like kind of unique little you know touches, and uh, I'm like, well, this is we're actually reaching in kind of a broader and broader audience. So yeah, man, thanks yeah, so much. Yeah, absolutely, a lot of Please fun. Please keep that up out there. That really <laughs> lets us feel like people are listening, and you know that's an exciting thing for us. So we do have some great uh, sponsors as well, and a little bit of a, a news flash for today, which we're excited to share. Maui Solar yep. Project, Tabuchi Electric America, Sonam Battery, Pika Energy, and our newest sponsor, Sundrum Energy, Sundrum Solar. So uh, these are Sundrum Solar. Sundrum thank you, Solar. Sir. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much, Michael. Michael was an amazing guest on on the show, uh, maybe about what I don't know, ten episodes ago or something, and he made the yep. number one quote of the year for it was pools make great batteries, right? That was our super... yeah, that was the quote from twenty seventeen. <laughs> <laughs> really fantastic, and he's absolutely and he's absolutely right. I mean, it takes a huge amount of energy to heat water, um, so it's it's really really a positive use for that type of absolutely. Situation. I want to give a shout out to Brian Footlick as well for putting that together, and we really look forward to collaborating with you and getting your amazing product line out here in Hawaii. Uh, Sundrum is really something very very special. So uh, yeah, and let's give one last announcement before we head into this uh, Maui Solar Project has a new retail space at Queen Kalamano Center Mall. We were planning on starting last week. Looks like we're going to start this week. We're just working on our documents and such. It's going to be a great opportunity to actually see models of the technology that we talk about here, be able to we get these big flat screen TVs. We're going to be sharing loads of great information. Joan is working on a bunch of content right now, so it's it's really exciting stuff. So do stop by, say hello. Uh, maybe we'll do some man-on-the-street interviews, Jay. Uh, actually, all right, you know. Yeah, that'd be a good idea. Um, we got podcasts, too. We'll just run through that real quick. We got iTunes, Stitcher, and TuneIn. And, uh, yeah, it's growing kind of organically, right? Yep, that's what social's all about. But do check it out. You are on your uh, podcast uh, network of choice. <laughs> okay, shall we jump into the news and events, Jay, uh, for today? Sounds like a good idea. I sent you some pictures earlier on, and we want to get through news relatively quickly because our caller is awesome. Absolutely. But these are really important, important news things. So the global news uh, of the day, high-efficiency solar panel pricing fell 37%. In 2017, that's huge. That's a big, and a big the drop. tariffs is the tariff is irrelevant. 
Ah, uh, yeah, is it? yeah. Well, is it? I mean, it is. It, it's I it's kind so. of a blip on the radar. I think is really what the tariffs will end up doing, in, in my opinion. But what, what yes, do you, what's your take yes, on it? Yes and no. I'm not so sure on this. I think the tariff is doing more damage than 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 good over time. Um, and I got some numbers to support that. But um, mm. the interesting thing is here that these high efficiency panels they've really ramped up production and. By doing so, economies of scale, they get to really push the pricing way down. And so, yeah, so these um, they got their numbers from they, they actually cite the IEA and that's wrong. It's the oh, yeah? IEA. It's the U.S. Energy Information Administration. Um, and they, they actually get their data in turn from the National Energy Laboratory. But um, right. they have they went into heavy detail on uh, where all the panels are actually coming from, how much they've cost, uh, the, the high efficiency panels. And it's basically what down to everybody is making high efficiency panels now. No one makes the garbage because no one wants the garbage. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, putting, uh, we did get into some, uh, for, the, for this show, we did some research on the history of PV. So we got a sense for this kind of, you know, downward trend in pricing, not only over the last couple of years, but actually oh, since the, the, the birth of, of photovoltaic, right? And I saw one quote right, that right. said, $40 a watt to 47 so hot, right? That was actually one right. <laughs> graph that I saw the other day. So when we talk about yep. high efficiency panels, you know, things like, uh, you know, Panasonic and Sun Powers and these kinds of things. Yeah, there were reductions in prices, right? 27%. Uh, and then it looks like a lot of the lines have shifted over from kind of one, you know, like a lower efficiency type of module to a higher efficiency module. And we're, we're continuing to see yep. that kind of uh, advancement and shifting over of the manufacturing lines. So that is a pretty, um, that's not a small delta there, that 20, it was 20, 37%. Unbelievable, really. Yeah, 37% in one year and it's all in the high efficiency high efficiency space so it's really really huge um, I dug up some interesting numbers though you talk about the tariff and, and things like that um, in we, I, we, we didn't obviously have a show back then but in 2012 the ITC actually issued an order to pay duties on um, Chinese panels before mm. so this has happened previously and we've been watching it right. over time um, and so what ended up happening is it was levied on Chinese cells specifically uh, to the tune of 31.73% uh, duty levied to SunTech Power Holdings okay. um, and 18.32% to um, Trina Solar, um, both companies that were importing heavily discounted Chinese manufactured right. cells. Mm -hmm. And so what ended up happening is the Chinese manufacturers said, well, okay, we'll manufacture them somewhere else. And so they moved a lot of their <laughs> right. stuff to Taiwan. And right. so, so Thai manufacturing in Taiwan would, would get around that little that duty assessment. And so in 2014, the IC, ITC issued another uh, new tariff on Chinese and Taiwanese cells uh, levied specifically at Jinko Solar and Rena Solar. Um, Rena Solar. And then it went to Vietnam. So, 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 so then they, well, that's that's the thing. I, I, I've done a lot of digging this week. Yeah. And so they moved, they moved manufacturing to Malaysia, South Korea, Singapore, and actually Germany, which is really right. interesting. And that's what we're dealing with now is all these cells are coming from other places in Asia and Germany, which I thought was a really interesting one. Um, those are those high efficiency, really yeah. well manufactured cells. But they're still all from foreign. Um, so in 2017, this new tariff is basically on all foreign manufactured cells. <laughs> so so they, they where are they it. going to move? <laughs> you know, they, uh, I, did, did they stop chasing it, or are we going to see some uh, domestic manufacturing, please? Well, that is uh, that is kind of the, the, the soup du jour, right? That's what our conversation is about mind. today. Just, just hold that in your mind right now. Okay. I, I find that really interesting, though, because you know if you, if you, if you were to trace those tariffs and then the, uh, the capital kind of injection, the infrastructure investment, and these other uh, – uh, you know, uh, countries across the across across Asia. I mean, you could one could argue that that's, that's actually having a positive impact on these communities as they get more and more jobs and more and more you know uh, industry in these environments, right? And so it's almost like you know the United States is saying, "Hey, China, go invest infrastructure in other places around the world." Not just China too; other manufacturers are doing their manufacturing in those spaces. Yeah, it happens in other spaces, yes, absolutely. Um, and that and that falls right into our our national news story, which is the Sun. SunPower just had their earnings call, yeah. um, and the article's title is SunPower Faces a Year of Transitions as the Tariff Kicks In. Um, we talked about this early on the show. Uh, SunPower is already feeling these negative effects uh, because everybody was, was buying up cells before the tariff would actually apply, um, or they were in jacking up prices already and taking some profit. Um, but they have seen a lot of delayed pr 
projects from 2018. So people are either delaying or basically the, the word used was some pro made some projects econ uneconomical. Yeah, yeah. Well, the thing about Sun Power, I mean, I could see how they'd be hit hard with this because, you know, they, first of all, you know, over the course of the last, let's say, three, four years, as as increased efficiency kind of uh, other types of panels came into market, it started to eat their market share, right? Because they were just the yeah, de facto yeah. high efficiency panel for a while. And then, you know, over the course of the last, uh, you know, uh, this recent period, I could see how it would be really problematic too because, uh, you know, their, their, their prices have, you know, traditionally been a lot more than what's available in market. Yeah, yeah, and they make their they actually make their cells in the Philippines and Mexico. Right. So you so, think, and we think of Sun Power as an American company, American manufacturer, but in actuality, their cells are made in other 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 national environments. Yeah, and they're owned by a French oil conglomerate. So. Total, right? It's Total. <laughs> yeah, 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 one yeah. of the largest uh, energy conglomerates in the world. So, yep. you know, um, Sun Power is really an interesting case. Uh, they're definitely making some changes to kind of weather this period. They're investing a lot of other stuff. We actually, Sun Power actually, I think, are they involved in the Hawaii segment, new segment as well? Uh, because yep, they, it's, right? it's, it's coming up again. They all, these these news they all link together. All tie together in a really really interesting way. Um, but going just finishing up the Sun Power thing. So they've instituted a hiring freeze. Uh, they're actually laying off 150 to 250 of their non manufacturing jobs, which is three percent of their total workforce globally. Um, and they've canceled the 20 million dollar investment that would have built next gen facilities in California and Texas. Yeah, so there's some contraction there, so and uh, a little yeah. bit of yeah, a little bit of domestic contraction, and it's really disappointing because I mean I would I would think they would definitely want to ramp up that uh, local manufacturing. I mean the thing is they're they're innovators, right? And they always have been innovators, yeah. but uh, you know I think really frankly I think their cost structure makes it a little tough for them to play ball right now. It's just I don't I don't know how they're going to do it. And that, you know there if you were to look at some of the major installations across the country though, people do. Uh, tend to pick Sun Power over the course of the last four or five years, you know, like uh, uh, the Apple, uh, the new Apple building in Silicon Valley is all Sun Power, for example. They have a lot of yeah, flagship they, they are, installs. They are the Apple of solar. They, those super high efficiency cells have been their uh, bread and butter. Yeah. They don't have a, a clear target. Yeah, we really got to follow Sun Power and see you know what their next play is because I mean I wouldn't count those guys out. They're a really remarkable company, um, but yeah. yeah, they're definitely in for it right now. Oh yeah, there you go, there you go. Well, well we okay. <laughs> Digging further, I got some. Mm -hmm. it's, it's yearly, it's geared yearly, and it will be half of what it is this year, like next year. Well, we definitely um, have heard language uh, uh, through that, you know, uh, to that effect in, in other places yeah, as well. Yeah, People are saying that's how it will go down. Delayed as opposed to canceled. Um, but one of the interesting things to come out of that is they're basically seeing 10 cents a watt increase for module pricing. Now, that was, mm. we, we had talked about that number before, um, but I wanted to get a sense of what that really means to these people. Mm. And for your average, so what... How much is an average residential install for you guys? Four kilowatt? What Three, size four. is it? Um, well, yeah, it, I mean, traditionally, it's been your average system size was about six, seven kilowatts. Oh, wow. uh, okay. across you know Hawaii in general, but that's changing nice because people. of all these new utility programs, right? So, like for example, with the right. new CGS pro program, we were just doing some sizing with that, and it looks like it makes sense to possibly size those down off of like you're not trying to go for 100 percent offset because of the way these utility right. programs work, or at least that's what it looks like at the moment. By the way, that CGS Plus program, seven megawatts available here in Maui County, uh, was uh, the online application materials came out. I think like two nights ago or something. So it's online. You can apply for that right now, or call Maui Solar Project. We'll help you get your application in. Right. It's it's about two thousand homes only. If yeah. You, if you run the numbers, it's only about two thousand homes. About four kilowatt hours, four kilowatts per system. There you go. It's only about mm -hmm. two thousand homes. So get it while you can. Yeah. Yeah. It's a yeah. limited bucket. That, that, that yeah. was what I was used. That's what I used. To result of the tariff, mm. uh, tariff oh there you go there you go increase would be um, and it turns out so four kilowatt hours that's four thousand watts times ten cents is four hundred dollars uh-huh so directly oh, you mean the difference uh, four hundred dollars addition additional on your your quote whatever you happen to be for residential install but the interesting thing comes could be start talking about <laughs> these massive yeah 
just these massive installs, right? Right. So you're talking about a, a one megawatt, which is a modest size little sure. farm. Sure. We've got a right? couple of three, um, three megawatts that's, going that's, in right now, right? That's in that's Alex. a million. That's a million watts. Right. Times ten. Times ten cents. That's that's a hundred thousand dollars. Right. Right. There you go. So. <laughs> and now, and now, if you talk about the new one, we're going to talk about in in uh, on on Kauai. Just a second. Mm -hmm. It's going to be twenty eight megawatts. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so eight million dollars added to the bottom line. Absolutely, yeah. So the, yeah, I mean, point taken, right? It's like the larger that you get, the more of an impact it has on that overall. Uh, you know, I guess that balance sheet, and you got to kind of you know reconsider, right? So, um, yeah. let's uh, let's jump right through the uh, the Hawaii uh, news and events, Jay, real fast, and then okay. uh, we will go into our uh, little history section that we want to do. We do have Andre on the line waiting for us, so we'll kind of pick things up a little bit, I think, right? So okay, just as a real. Real quick, um, so AES and the Kauai Island Utility Cooperative have broken ground on Hawaii's largest solar plus storage system. Uh, there's no online date, but it's going to bring them to 60% uh, total renewable generation and storage on island on Kauai. So fantastic Big for them. One. It's 11%. It's, it's, it's a huge install. It's, it's Hawaii's largest. Uh, 28 megawatt, 100 megawatt hour battery. So that's about five hours of duration for them. Yeah, but just absolutely fantastic install. But th this is the cool line. Their energy cost is 11 cents a kilowatt hour. There you go. That's uh, <laughs> that's pretty good. And I think that's what's being sold though to the grid, right? So people are still paying yeah. the 30 or 40 out there. That's going on. I can't. Well, it's a, city, right? it's a cooperative, but, but that's but that's that's crazy. That's yeah. So that's much better. Big big impact. Big impact. So there's yeah. our news and events, folks. Um, we're gonna you know we wanted to take a little time. Obviously, we're you know we got a lot to cover today. We're talking about the history of solar. We're gonna hear all about the new technology, and and Andre's gonna help us walk through from Meyer Berger and help us walk through kind of like the real you know story of of photovoltaic and how it's generated, but as we uh, try to get a sense for, you know, once we get start talking about, talking about history, then we go, well, where did it begin, right? And so we came up with a couple of things. There's, a, there's an article on uh, Solar Power World Online in 2013. It says, you will pay homage to these 24 solar pioneers, right? And I thought, oh, it's going to be some guys, <laughs> like, from the 70s in Mendocino County or something. And number one is Archimedes. And I go, what, yep. <laughs> what on earth is that? And they're talking about how he, uh, it was, he used uh, shields to concentrate uh, energy onto the ships in like a war, I guess a warlike setting, right? So it, yeah. this is the, kind of the first mention of a, of, a, of concentrated solar powers. They consider him the father of concentrated solar power. So this is back in 2, 212 BC. There's actually some solar mention in 212 BC, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. I mean, they were, they used the reflective um, properties of the bronze shields. The Roman Empire were besieged in Syracuse, and uh, I think MythBusters actually did an episode of this where they okay. tested it to see if they could actually focus enough <laughs> solar power on uh, on a ship to do it. And, it. and it turned out to be really, really difficult. But I mean, it was it was an interesting concept at the very least, and the fact that it was documented that early, seriously, uh, trying to harness harness the power of the sun for anything. So really, this really is a cool. this is a really fun article. We're not going to go through too much of it, but there are 24 like points throughout history where they touch on how solar was being implemented in really kind of surprising ways. Maybe I'll grab one more. Uh, there's this fella, yeah, the, the actual fella that, um, what's his name here? Edmund Becquerel going down to the bottom of this list in 1839. French scientist discovers the photovoltaic effect, right? I never heard of this fella before. Yep. Apparently he's responsible for, uh, for discovering this, this, this property. Yeah, uh, basically it was really simple. He was made an electrolytic uh, solution, uh, put a couple electrodes in the in the cell uh, in a jar, and then exposed it to light and noticed that there was an increase in electrical generation when it was in the sun as opposed to not. There you go. There you go. I mean, you know, it's. It, I mean, it's what's what's. What's kind of amazing is that there was this kind of pre-photovoltaic kind of history of, of solar doing various things. You know, there's other other fellows which we won't get into. Uh, Robert Sterling, for example, and uh, and this I can't even pronounce this fellow's name. Horace de Saussure. He's a Frenchman, right? <laughs> he mm -hmm. did a solar cooker like we were trying to do the other day with the uh, turkey. Remember that one? <laughs> so, yeah. Well, let's try that again next year. I do want to I do want to cook a turkey right. well, on got, solar for Thanksgiving. I think well, that's a really good idea. We got Memorial Day coming up. We can do some burgers or something like that. You know. So. Oh, there you go. Fantastic. <laughs> they, then, they were out in Africa. <laughs> using these solar cookers. I, mean, that, <laughs> I, I had never thought of that before, but it, imagine it. You're on safari, 
you out make... there by the sailing ship and you're using solar cookers out in the bush. You know, right. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> so solar is not a new concept, uh, people. It's certainly been out there for a long time. And then uh, we got into a little bit of the photovoltaic, and we're going to hear all about photovoltaic coming up soon from uh, – Andre Berger, uh, Andre um, Richter from Meyer Berger. But uh, for, uh, some of the things that surprised me, for example, in 1905, Albert Einstein published the first theoretical work describing the photovoltaic effect. So we've heard of that fellow before. Yeah, I think I know who he is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and in 53, I think this is kind of where uh, Andre is going to pick up. We have Bell Labs, mm -hmm. New Jersey. Thank you, New Jersey. Uh, developing yep. the first silicon solar cell capable of generating a measurable electric current. So, um, you know, you, there's just amazing history stuff that us as solar geeks I weren't necessarily aware of. We were talking about things this morning, just kind of sharing and saying, wow, this is this is new to us, right? This is amazing. I also like the fella in 58 um, that, that kind of pushed uh, the space program into developing the solar cells. That, what was his name again, Jay? Yeah, huh? he, was, he, was, he, was, he was harassing the Navy a lot. Um, was it? Dr. Was Hans Ziegler. Yeah, Hans Ziegler, yeah. Um, he was harassing the Navy because they wanted um, – solar cells for the Vanguard satellite communications system. And there was, he was arguing that the batteries that they wanted to send would basically not work after, after a very, very short period of time uh, because of temperatures and, and environmental factors. And he was absolutely right, but it was a long, hard argument. And he eventually won. Uh, they, would, they put solar cells and battery on the satellite. And you know what? Battery failed. <laughs> solar cells kept working. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, absolutely. This is just, these are great stories of pioneers out there that just kind of pushed it forward. There's um, this fella as well in the 70s. I really like the conversation about Dr. Elliot Berman. This is a bit of a surprise mm. here. It might be a bit of a surprise to people. So in, 19, in the 1970s, Dr. Elliot Berman, with financial help from Exxon Corporation, <laughs> designed a mm -hmm. significantly less costly solar cell by using poorer grade silicon and packaging the cells with cheaper materials. And this was responsible for bringing the price down from $100 to $20 per watt. So, uh, you know, actually it looks like Exxon had a pretty uh, serious hand in, in helping to, you know, marketize, kind of bring it to market like solar cells, right? Oh, it makes absolute sense that they would want to be involved. They want to know exactly what the potential of this other energy generation yeah. stream, revenue stream could be. <laughs> so there's loads of other great stories out there, this kind of arc of history of, of uh, not only photovoltaics, but also solar. And we're going to hear all about what's going on today and how we came to this kind of point in technology from Andre Richter shortly. Uh, let's jump into our commercials and we'll pick up Andre uh, on the way out. All right. Aloha and welcome to Maui Solar Project. It is easy to feel rejuvenated just stepping outside on a magnificent Hawaiian day. Maui Solar Project is here to help harness that energy you feel in your body and use it to power your homes and businesses. As Laura tells us, Maui harnessed the sun so as to slow its path across the sky. Join Maui Solar Project as we harness the sun's energy and slow Hawaii's dependence on fossil fuels. Call Maui Solar Project at 269-2352. MauiSolarProject.org. So, Rootsy Electric. A leading worldwide inverter manufacturer presents the second generation of the eco-intelligent battery system, the IBIS. Tabuchi's grid-friendly system includes a high-efficiency inverter, stackable batteries, and integration with Jelly software for the most adaptable battery storage system on the market. The system is optimized for energy management and cost performance. Maximize your solar investment with Tabuchi's electric eco-intelligent battery system. The Stone and Batter Eco is an energy storage solution that utilizes intelligent energy management software. The system is available in a variety of storage capacities and allows for expansion. Stone and Battery Eco allows you to save money by harvesting energy from your solar PV system and using that stored energy when rates are more expensive. Stone and Battery Eco is specifically designed to provide you and your family peace of mind in the event of power outage. Our unique power detection system will sense outages in real time and automatically switch over to battery power. See Sonen Battery Eco at sonen-battery.com. MIT-founded Pika Energy, makers of the Pika Energy Island, a smart energy management system that uses solar panels, lithium batteries, and intelligence to manage your energy and keep you powered, even during outages. With a clean, intelligent alternative to grid power, you're in control of your energy future. Pika's Energy Island lets you manage electrical costs with HECO-ready self-supply functions. Pika's largest battery, the Harbor Plus, offers 16 kilowatt hours of stored energy and can power loads of up to 10 kilowatts. And if you need more capacity, just add a second or even third Harbor Smart battery to the same system for a maximum of 48 kilowatt hours of usable storage. Pika Energy, own your power. To learn more, visit pika-energy.com. Okay, those are our great sponsors, Jay. Uh, those wonderful companies that have helped keep the solar coaster on air for nearly a year now. And 
and Sundrum. We don't, can't forget about that. In fact, let's Sundrum. do a manual plug for them. Yeah, Sundrum, <laughs> uh, Michael and Brian and all the folks out there at Sundrum. We really love your product and can't wait to get your commercial cut, which we'll, maybe I'll play with after the show. <laughs> It'd be a lot of fun. There you go. So right. uh, we're going to run right into a conversation with Andre Richter from Meyerberger. Meyerberger is a remarkable company out of Switzerland. And we may have some connection issues here or there. He's actually calling in from, from Munich, so we'll just kind of play it by ear and see how we do. Um, so, Andre, can you hear us uh, out there in, in, in Germany? Yes, I can hear you. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for calling in, Andre. Uh, you know, Andre and I met each other uh, back in, I think, with uh, – where were we at SBI? In, in Vegas, I think, Jay, right? And uh, yep. we, we met uh, Andre, and we were like, wow, this fella really knows his stuff. He, uh, he is working with a company called Meyer Burger. And uh, he's going to get he, – he actually was just out here in Maui, I think, about maybe a week or so ago, Andre. How long – when were you here? Just about, like, one week ago, maybe? No, four nights. So, effective uh, three days or two days. Too okay. short to see on Maui. Maui. <laughs> Too short, yeah. Well, we'll have to get you back soon. And I sat down with Andre, and he, he, he basically really schooled me in photovoltaic uh, history and technology. And I was so blown away by it. I was like, we really got to get you on the show right away, basically, right? So I gave Andre a call, <laughs> and he kindly uh, offered to come in and talk to us about solar a little bit. So, Andre, why don't you give us a little introduction and let us know a little bit about yourself and your company, and we'll just kind of take it from there. Okay. Also, I'm, I'm working since almost 30 years in the solar industry, and um, I'm now more than eight years with Maya Bogar. And my book is a very specific technology company uh, uh, existing since 1953, uh, and it's for the solar industry in wafer cell and model production. Mm. Is it for the equipment? So my book is developing the processes and the equipment to produce solar cells and models. Got it. And of course, we are active also in semiconductor and specialized technology. So we have a huge broad portfolio. Uh, in the technology there. Right. Okay. Okay. And then, um, so, and you're involved in, in, in primarily bifacial manufacturing today, right? Is that really kind of your main product line or the, or the tooling for bifacial manufacturing? No, no. no. Uh, actually, uh, as you know, uh, we have the big solar industry. The production volume is much more uh, as 100 gigawatts and worldwide. And today is a big upgrade ongoing from the old or the, from the former technology, the aluminum black surface steel technology of the solar cell to a perp technology. And there, uh, Maya Boga has a market share of around yeah, between 60 and 95% worldwide. Okay, yeah, okay. This is now the main issue. So the shift from the backside uh, technology to the perk technology, that's kind of like the main, the main transition. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and, of course, we have developed already the next or the second next step in the solar uh, because we have to prove and to provide a reliable technology. And so uh, we have now the high, latest edge cutting technology. What we have is now the heterojunction bifacial smart wire technology, so we're calling it. Wow. That's and a st- this <laughs> is really amazing with a lot of energy yield. Perhaps we we'll speak later about it. Okay, so that's a mouthful, right? Heterojunction, smart wire, bifacial technology. This is kind of like the tip of the spear in solar doing the most kind of generation, but we're going to hear all about that soon. So did you want to give us a walkthrough of some of the different types of, of, uh, of solar, solar panels for our, for our listeners? Uh, yes, sure. So um, perhaps, as you know, the solar cell, the first solar cell was made in USA yeah, from the Bell Lab in 1954, and this was already a, a very good solar cell based on very um, advanced materials, but of course the efficiency was not so good for the very first solar cell, and they used the, it was a technique use of semiconductor wafers, of the wafer of the semiconductor production, which had been failed in the production, had been used for solar cells. So in the very first time, you find round solar cells. This is an uh, indicator for this. Right, right. And We've seen those, then, right? Yeah. Yeah, and then in 1990, uh, they get more and more solar cells, and for the solar cells, the way they had a dedicated thorn, also cut it from a silicon slab, from a silicon ingot, and for example, there, Maya Boga has provided the wire saw to cut this brittle material silicon. 
I see. And this okay. was in, in the year 2000 around the mass production started. So this was because there are two effects. One effect was uh, there was a new technology invention coming into mass production. Uh, this was at least. So you can get the solar cell, you put just a wafer, solar wafer, and uh, deposit in the solar wafer a PN junction, so called PN junction. So this enables you to separate the charges in a solar wafer in plus and minus. So you have one side is plus and the other side is negative. And when with the aluminium BSF you can increase your efficiency yeah, by uh, additional processing step. And this was uh, uh, one effect. The second effect was there was in Germany starting the uh, Erneuerbare Energien Gesetz, as EEG called. And this was the first time you get a right to fit in your energy from the solar system into the grid, into the public grid. And with this, um, oh, there we go. Looks like we might have got you back there. Can you hear us, Andre? Yeah. Okay. moment, we have uh, then bigger production in USA and big production in Japan in this time. Uh, we get then more and more uh, of bigger production in all Asia. And um, today we have production volume of the biggest China-based manufacturers of 8 gigawatts a year for one production company, for example. Okay, so okay. So we're, we're hearing a, lot, a little bit of feedback here, Andre, but I certainly got some of those things, so I'll recap a little bit. But, I mean, it looks like you, uh, Meyer Burgers played a role in uh, the evolution of solar from a very early period, from the early, uh, you know, 50s. And then we were, I think we were just talking about the, uh, the, the, the monocrystalline, uh, cru- the, the, the monocrystalline uh, ingot that comes out of the crucible. So for people that haven't thought about solar panel production in this way in the past, uh, you effectively uh, – you, you, you're – creating this kind of long kind of like cylindrical looking thing and you're pulling it out of this crucible and you're effectively slicing it almost like a deli meat you slice the deli meat of those monocrystalline wafers and then out um and they were it was meyer burger it turns out that made that saw <laughs> so the they have been involved in this process of creating the technology to be able to uh to to effectively uh, in, you know kind of walk solar down the road throughout history for quite a long time so where do we leave off uh, andre are you still there yep we're getting them on the line Oh, we're gonna get another call in to try to get away. Try to try to uh, get away from that little buzzing sound. He is calling in from Munich, after all. So you know, technology. We never know what's gonna happen. We kind of give it a shot, right, Jay? Need more solar panels on that satellite. <laughs> <laughs> he sounded really good this morning when we tested it out. <laughs> yeah, it, sounded, it sounded fine. Yeah, no, that's actually the reason why those old solar panels were round. The cells were round is because they came out as a as a single crystal and and were were sliced up. Um, they're also that's as big as you could grow them. Mm. They would actually love. They would love to recover those little, little diamond shapes in between because every area, every area that you don't cover is a loss. There you but go. They simply couldn't couldn't grow them any bigger. <laughs> okay. Well, we got Andre back online. We're going to take another another shot out of here, and we're going to jump right into that point in, in history. Hey, Andre, you're back yep. online. Hopefully, the connection's a little bit better. Hey there. Yeah. Sorry for that connection. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Now we can hear you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So uh, where do we leave off? We were just talking about the uh, the sawing of the uh, monocrystalline cells in the cruci- uh, you know, coming out of the crucible, and then was there wh- wh- were we at the uh, the the thin film uh, section, or where did you want to go from there? Yes, also we have two in the solar um, or to generate solar energy. You have two possibilities. You can do a wafer based uh, technology, or you can deposit the solar cell on the glass direct. So and that's thin film. film technology, and you have a lot of different variations in thin film technology. Um, but today, 90%, 95% of the market is wafer-based because efficiency is higher and the production costs are almost in the same region than thin film. Right, right. But thin film, of course, you have, uh, uh, I think First Solar, one of these uh, manufacturers out here right now, are getting a lot of play because of the tariffs, right? And they're a thin film mm-hmm. manufacturer. So they're actually, I think I just saw a list of kind of ranked, you know, production. And it looks like you know, they're doing, they're looking at ramp- ramping up their production. I don't know if that's, uh, you know, a, a 
I mean, I guess it's related to the tariffs, <laughs> right? But uh, well, so, thin film anywhere is not apply. The tariff does not apply, so it doesn't really matter where it comes from. But yeah, right, right. It's not a, you're right. Silicon is the type that is uh, the tariff. Silicon, is relevant, silicon so. cells are the one that's yeah, correct. Okay, so that's thin film. Are there any other uh, technologies along that road, uh, Andre, that you wanted to touch on? Of course, there's a long development of the uh, uh, solar technologies over the past 30, 40 years. So, uh, and and the the most development you see or you use today in the mass production has been already developed 20 or 25 years ago. So, it's, there are not new technologies, but it's a challenge to get a low cost, high efficient, high productive uh, mass manufacturing of the solar cells. Mm. So, this challenge challenge has to be solved for every new solar technology. Mm. So the next step is now to perk, this is solved, and now uh, 20, 30 gigawatt uh, per year, uh, the old technology is upgraded to the new technology perk. It's a huge quality. Mm. And when we say perk, we're talking, what is it, passive emitting rear contact? Is that the accepted uh, 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 description of perk? Yes, also I just heard a little uh, from your discussion, and it's all about losses. Mm -hmm. So at the end, uh, you have a silicon wafer. The photon is absorbed in the silicon wafer and generate charges. And this charges, plus and minus, they will come together. They will do a recombination again. And you have to avoid this. And everything which disturbs this effect will do a recombination, so it will produce losses. And so you do a TN junction to separate the surfaces, and you passivate the wafer. This is the trick. And the perk cell, or the development from the aluminium back surface field to the perk technology, is just to have a better passivation of the rear side at the wafer. Okay, now I happen to be looking at some graphs here that try to explain that to me, so I'm able to kind of get my head around it. I'd say about eighty percent, <laughs> but uh, but so that's the perk technology, and and is that is that kind of present day technology? Is that what is is presently the, like the the leading technology of the day? Yes, if you buy today a high efficient or more efficient module, it's most likely perk. Got it. Yep. So that's how we were able to go, Jason, from the mm -hmm. maybe the two eighties of, of of three or four years ago to the three twenties of today. That was you know we when we right. know we know which companies are right. So it's like they they're using yep. that primary technology to make those work. So that's that's actually good to know. And then uh, what's the next stage of this, uh, Andre? So there are many many technologies besides this uh, perk technology. Uh, if you like to mention, this is the uh, from Sun Power, the IDC technology is very famous, and this is very, very high efficient. Uh, but of course, if you you have always to consider the manufacturing cost, and if you get more efficiency according to the cost, you you have still a model you are uh, in business, but uh, it's it's hard. Uh, usually, you do a small development step in the production. To always ensure that you increase your cost a little and you increase your efficiency of this. Ah, okay. So, um, a second famous uh, cell technology is uh, from Zanio Panasonic today. The heterojunction or HIT module is perhaps known. They're very high efficient and they have been the first modules that have been bi -patient. And this is very interesting for the energy use data. Mm, mm. Yeah, so those uh, heterojunction cells became really popular over the last few years. I know that a lot of people are using them here in Maui. Yes, I do. Also, if you put all we have today mega trends in the world for solar, the mega trends are you go to high efficiency. Uh, second mega trend is you to, to go to glass glass modules. You have a better encapsulation, better sealing. You go for better encapsulation materials uh, like used today. You go to N-type wafers, it's more, uh, less losses, you can say, and you go to uh, wire connection technology. Wow, so and if you take all... Just to, yeah. just, to, just to recap, you had said mega trends. I love that phrasing there, mega trends. So these are kind of like the, the core technological advances when brought together really create something that is a, a powerful kind of significant difference in energy production. So uh, yeah, and we're going to hear all about this, right, Andre? So yeah, please do continue to explain. Yeah, if you if you now you can put all the megatons together with the heterojunction technology, and, uh, which is 
third set, the heterocyclic smart wire bifaces module, solar module, uh, is inheriting all this mega trends together. And and is this that so this is what your tooling is focusing on today? Is that correct? And my my broker has a has a big R and D. We are spending a lot of R and D, and we had to to try to be three to five years ahead of the development. Mm, this is very difficult. Mm. And uh, we are producing our, our, our tools are for the mass production. So we are not a niche market. We are delivering to the worldwide solar industry. And so we had to uh, recognize the mega trends uh, as early as possible and then try to get a certified module, for example, and to get a qualified, reliable mass production. Mm. Uh, this is happening. Or the heterojunction smart wire already. Yeah. So we're really talking about the future right now. So this is what's going on at the moment. But you're 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 capturing these mega trends over the last few years, and then you're bringing it to to become market viable and market ready. And and there are some products on the market today right now that that represent that combination of mega trends. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. all, almost yes, almost. Almost. There are some modules available, uh, but not all together. Gotcha, gotcha. And what's what's the uh, overall uh, impact on energy production when you bring those mega trends together and when you go to market with a product like that? What is the what what, what is it all about? What's the overall result? Yeah, this is this is really amazing. Uh, first, you have to know you have um, a monofacial solar module. Monofacial solar module is only directly to the sun with a sensitive side, and the rear side is a wide sheet, whatever. Uh, and can't, uh, this module can't collect from the rear side to sunlight. And the bifacial modules, they can generate from both sides sunlight. And um, there's an interesting combination because the head junction cell is by nature a bifacial cell. So you have to do nothing to have a bifacial cell. So why you have not a bifacial module? Hmm. Uh, so you can uh, get from the rear side all this um, sunlight you can collect. And uh, this is one point. The other point is, uh, if you now compare the monofacial standard technology with the bifacial developed technology of the also aluminum DSS per per per, yeah, you can do this chain more and more. Uh, there are more and more tricks to improve the cell, small tricks. Uh, if you compare this diffuse technology with the heterojunction technology, you have already a second improvement in the energy yield. So you have three steps of energy yield. The heterojunction will gain you 10% to 50%. It depends on the overall position. More energy compared to a monofacial and 10% uh, to 25% to, uh, or 20% compared to a bifacial uh, diffuse technology where you which will be the next step of first. So okay. We are, we are the over next step. <laughs> okay, okay. So, energy production. So, okay, so just, and, and that's that's remarkable. And just to kind of like recap that, we're talking about taking current efficiencies that are in market and adding to that 10% energy uh, power or energy capability uh, all the way up to 50%, right? So if I'm hearing you correctly, if we, what you mean by that is if we have a 300-watt module that can be a plus to, to like 330, or it could be up to, what is that, four, uh, 450, 450 watts? Does that sound right? Is that the right type of math? And I would say in a different way. Uh, you have a solar panel and you produce, or solar system, and you produce 1,000 kilowatt hours a year for mm -hmm. the system. Mm -hmm. And then you can add the 10% or 50%. Okay, so if we think in terms of if we think in terms of annual energy production, we can see a ten to fifty percent increase by basically combining these mega trends into a market viable product. Right? That's that's pretty much the takeaway. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, we are measuring the different climate zones of the world, uh, comparing the products. The products are all uh, measured by a um, third party lab. And uh, then we compare getting this energy yield. Of course, the 50% are very in a very specific um, singular uh, combination of, of environmental conditions. Like in, in the desert in Morocco or something like yeah. that, right? <laughs> very hot, yeah. A lot of sunshine, yeah. Okay. 
So okay, okay. So I get it. So this is a this is a, this is a profound difference in, in in energy production annually that we're talking about here, right? A huge leap, and uh, this is just around the corner. So are we are we going to see uh, manufacturing facilities around the world shift to this very aggressively, or and what kind of a rate do you see this uh, people uh, people or rather companies in the manufacturing business shifting over to this type of technology? Yeah. So if you imagine you have now a production running with. Six gigawatts per year, also mm. hundreds of lines, yeah, producing uh, solar models and solar cells. Then you not will stop all the lines and invest in the new factory. So, in this, if you have this kind of factory, you will have a development step by step from mm. Perth to Perth, or and so on, yeah. And you will not go to a complete different new technology. Right. And the hydro junction technology, this will be a new greenfield investment. Um, but then you get this amazing effect. Yeah, I see. Okay, and then I know that there that a part of this conversation, Andre, which I was really fascinated by when you, we were talking uh, a couple weeks ago uh, here in Maui, is this notion of the smart wire. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because I think there's something very special in the in, in in that technology that encourages us to potentially set up new manufacturing facilities. You know, in one fell swoop. Yeah, smart, smart wire. We have to, uh, today we have to see what is the sales made. The sales have already printed the bus part on it. There you can solder the ribbon later. This is those so little silver, the, the silver color that you see on top of the silicon cells in a regular solar panel, right? Correct. This is the cell to cell connection. And this is a small you know, copper wire. Yeah, the, the shiny from the thin. And this cell to cell interconnection is already given by the production of the solar cell. The smart wire is different. For the smart wire, you need to weigh all the printing, the silver printing for the for soldering the ribbon later on. Mm -hmm. You just take the solar cell with fingers, and then later you can decide when you produce the module how many wires and how thick you use for interconnection. So this so is this fascinating. Yeah, this gives you a big advantage because you can now decide uh, are you have a region with a lot of sunshine. So, so you can use thick wires or you use more wires. Mm -hmm. And if you have a region with less sunshine, you can uh, produce a module with less wires or thinner wires. So you have less shading and you can adapt always to the local conditions. Gotcha. So yeah, this is just something really special here. So we're we're actually talking about we're gonna call we're making a call to get Jay back online in a second. So you're gonna hear that right there. Um, we got uh, we got we got we got people in this show from Japan and Germany at the same time. That's probably that's a solar coaster first, I think. But uh, speaking of two different locations, Germany's a cold environment. Well, I guess Japan could be cold too. You're in Osaka, right, Jay? So uh, I was, I was <laughs> throwing snowballs the other day. Okay, there you go. So in these environments, you know uh, it, what, what Andre just said about this smart wire, which is which is uh, which is one of the things I'm most excited about here. Of course, I could get excited about bifacials pretty easily too. But when we think about these, uh, this, smart, this smart wire, there's the opportunity to create solar panels for a specific microclimate. So you, you literally could pr produce the cells in one location and then, you know, uh, uh, and then ship those cells over. When I say cells, I mean those little square things you see in a solar panel. Ship them over to an assembly uh, site, and that assembly site uh, makes the, 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 the specific uh, smart wire requirements for those panels, and then they're drop ship right to job, basically, right around the corner. So there's no expensive shipping around the world of these solar panels, not to mention the fact that shipping uses a bunch of uh, diesel or, or uses a bunch of carbon-based uh, you know, uh, fuel, right? Yeah, At least right now. Fuels. Shipping until the eco ship <laughs> comes talked, in and fixes that, that problem, yeah, right? Until comes in. <laughs> right. So this is really a, a something special, Andre. I mean, do you, and so do you, are you starting to see examples of this type of manufacturing manufacturing uh, systems being set up where you have this central uh, cell uh, manufacturing uh, uh, facility, like a factory, and then radially outwards different um, assembly plants with with the distinct types of smart wires being developed. So like. Are you, are you seeing this happen today, or is it gonna? When when, when is it gonna happen? Yes, we have already uh, only smart wire uh, production, so they buy cells. They, they do they order specific cells without the bus part, only the finger. You can do it, and then uh, they are producing their own smart wire models. We have several manufacturers uh, around the world now, and even one in Miami. In Miami, no kidding, in Miami. So, yeah, so, so what? I, so what I heard there was that the 
in the in the warmer environments, you want to have thicker wires because you're, I suppose, you're transmitting more energy, and uh, that's more efficient. But if you're in a colder environment, they're thinner wires. Is that what you said? Yes, this is, but this is only one advantage of the smart wire. Yeah, uh, have, there's another advantage. If you see a solar cell and, and you have, uh, you put the solar module outside, if you have strong wind and you have always uh, moving the solar module a little, then you might have some micro cracks in the solar cell. And the smart wire covers all the steel cell uh, surface. So if you have a micro crack, the smart wire or one of the wires, of the lost wires of the smart wire will reconnect always all parts of the solar cell. So you not can get really losses by micro cracks. It is very micro crack tolerant technology. Right. So so the, okay. So there are there are some other specific uh, advantages to being able to manufacture solar uh, modules from a uh, from for a specific geography. We're actually Jason here has a has a point he's going to bring up. So Jay, can you hear us? Okay. Yeah, this, that's that's a really interesting question. I mean, micro cracks are a. Uh, phenomenon that happens throughout the panel's life and actually reduce efficiencies. So do you see increased uh, longevity from these smart wire cells? Yes, yes. We have already simulated it. You can uh, flash solar modules today by bending them. You do a flash and the so-called electroluminescent picture of the module in different mechanical states. And if you do it with a normal, today, uh, the standard module, uh, you get to see the cracks growing by bending the module more and more. And if you release the module to the uh, last, uh, to the standard position, then not all cracks will close. So you will lose some part of the solar cell. And with a smart wire, you see nothing. Yeah, you can bend so many times you like, uh, there is no impact. Got it. Got it. Wow. So, uh, you know, what's, uh, and so, Andre, when I remember we were having this conversation and I said, and I was like, geez, if that's the case, it could be cheaper to manufacture domestically than it could be to ship internationally with these things, right? Because you would want to, you, you would, you, you'd get a better performing panel by manufacturing it locally because you'd manufacture it to the specific uh, g microclimate uh, requirements of a given area, right? So it wouldn't make sense to ship in a module from somewhere else that would have, you know, kind of these basically a blunt manufacturing method for a, 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 a use-all for anywhere, right? You'd want something right. specific. So at that point, it actually motivates or incentivizes the idea of creating manufacturing facilities locally anywhere in the world. Am, am I hearing that correctly? Yes, you're right, uh, sure. Uh, so, first point is, of course, the new technology, for example, heterogeneous for smart wire, bifacial, dark dark module should not be more expensive than even with better materials used than the standard module. And this is just minus you pay today for the module area and not anymore for the power in production. Uh, so, the production costs are not so different. Uh, this is the first important point. And, of course, the second point is, you can then use the solar cells if you, for example, produce in U.S. mainland uh, solar cells uh, for smart wire, asphalt tree, uh, it can ship them to Hawaii, and then Hawaii can produce the solar models. There you go. So we can actually have manufacturing capabilities here in Hawaii, not necessarily this, the development of the cells, but the assembly of the cells that are that are created somewhere else. So, Andre, we're going to have to wrap now. We're just we got about a minute or so left in the show. I want to thank you so much for the amazing uh, uh, information that you shared with us. And uh, let everyone know that Andre is going to be back on for another show to specifically talk about how America could create all of its own solar panels through this amazing technology with microclimate specific technology developed by Meyerberger Tooling. So thank you so much, yeah. Andre. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, we look forward to the next show. Okay, this has been the Solar Coaster, folks. Thanks so much for listening. Uh, we are a renewable energy talk show right here in lovely Maui County every Friday, 105 p.m., KOA 1110 a.m. Uh, we are sponsored by Maui Solar Project, Sonen Battery, Pika Energy, Tabuchi Electric America, and Sundrum Solar. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. Thank you, sponsors. Check the website, solar-coaster.com. Hit click like and subscribe. Thank you. All right. Aloha, folks. Have a great Friday, great weekend.